Okay. Sarah Hobby. Okay, everybody, we can make it, right? We're almost there. I feel like we should get up and dance or something. Um, so thanks for sticking with us. Um, I'm from the MSP LTER, so we're the newest site in the network. Um, a couple bits of news. Um, one of our co-PIs, Bonnie Keeler, just got a $10 million grant from the DOE um, to set up a technical assistance center. And this is really to increase the capacity for communities to basically get resources to address um, pollution issues as well as invest in clean energy technologies. Other site news, we have a logo now, which is very exciting. Um, other site news, I thought I would highlight a, a paper that came out recently. This was led by Rebecca Walker, who is defending her dissertation today. So I can't be there, unfortunately. Um, she's a student of Bonnie's and Kate Derrickson's. Um, and this is a project where she did a historical analysis and showed that in the early part of the 20th century, that basically the real estate developers in Minneapolis were working really closely with the with government officials, so the city of Minneapolis, to basically invest in parks and to, to get resources invested in parks. And at the same time, they were establishing um, discriminatory uh, housing practices, so racial covenants. So the legacy of that, um, those relationships and those practices can be seen today where we see um, basically tight associations between race, temperature, parkland, and tree cover. So white people live where it's cooler, where there's more parks, where there's more tree cover. But today I'm just gonna focus on scaling questions related to urban forests. I tried to pick one example, Marty, um, and ask how we're interested in how biodiversity influences forest vulnerability to stressors like uh, extreme climate events, pests and pathogens. And then in turn, how does forest vulnerability to stressors relate to social vulnerability? And so, Really, we're interested in testing this hypothesis that um, stems from work that's been done at other LTER sites where we expect that um, higher diversity of the forest is related to higher productivity or higher canopy cover, and that higher diversity also um, confers higher resilience um, to discrete um, or to pulse disturbances, essentially. And so we might expect to see relationships like this, and we further might expect, based on work that's been done in places like Baltimore, that we would see more diverse, um, higher tree canopy cover in white wealthier neighborhoods compared to poorer um, BIPOC neighborhoods. So this seems like a relatively simple hypothesis, but in order to test it actually requires scaling forest biodiversity and productivity over both space and time. And so this is something that we're trying to do. Um, and we're using um, the, the JEDI uh, uh, air, uh, spaceborne LIDAR platform as well as Sentinel-2 uh, multispectral imagery. Um, and so this is work that's been uh, led by uh, Vinny Marcilio da Silva, who's here. He's a postdoc with me and Janine Cavender Bears, as well as Sally Donovan, who's a grad student with us. And so they um, went out last uh, summer and uh, got a whole bunch of data from forest patches across the Twin Cities Metro um, to essentially um, develop, get the training data um, uh, in both terms of both forest structure and forest um, biodiversity across a, a diversity of ecoregions. Um, and I just thought I want to make sure that you all know Vinny is here. Um, wave, Vinny. Um, so Vinny really has done all this work. I know nothing about machine learning. Um, and so these are the uh, models that are the subset of the models that he developed. So just showing that using this combination of Jedi LIDAR and Sentinel-2 that we can do a pretty good job of predicting um, aspects of diversity and structure of the urban forest. And so Vinny's used that then uh, to predict more broadly in the JEDI footprint um, metrics of forest biodiversity and structure. So here's just an example looking at species richness. And so then we hope to be able to take these um, predictions and start to look at relationships with things like socioeconomic factors. Um, and so what we really want to do is actually test this hypothesis, which requires time series. Um, and so, you know, we're hopeful that we'll be able to use this approach um, to, to look over time as well, because 
well, Jedi is at least with us for a little while longer. Um, you know, Sentinel too is is projected to to continue out. So I think this raises the challenge or some of the challenges that I think reiterate what others have talked about. That you know, so one challenge with using this kind of remote sensing approach um, to look at temporal dynamics is that you really need high resolution multi and hyperspectral imaging over time. And we never kind of know what's coming down the pipe and what we'll be able to have continuously over time or even periodically over time. Um, and then I think the other issue which has been raised in a number of talks is that it, you know, it's not just enough to have these remote sensing products, but you actually need the capacity and the capability to use those remote, remote sensing products in a way that's not gonna cause you to do things that are er erroneous, I guess is one way to put it. Um, so to be able to ask questions about biodiversity um, and, and more broadly to address sustainability challenges that we're facing. So um, I would urge you, if you have questions, to really talk to Vinny. And it does sound like there's a lot of overlapping interests. So hopefully we can have good discussions about these kinds of approaches um, in the breakout groups. <laughs>